Hey everybody. It is 1.57 a.m. on Thursday, October 16th, 2014. I've got you down here in my computer lab. I'm going to ask you for your help. Okay? Now, the reason I'm asking you for your help is the National Nurses Union is trying to get a hold of the White House and elected officials who are ignoring the nurses about this Ebola outbreak. Now, I, I'm sure you guys have, you know, all have your opinions on the Ebola outbreak, whether you support it, whether you think it's real, a hoax, an outbreak in Africa. The nurses are asking for our help to get the word out that they aren't prepared for any kind of contagious outbreak. This video, it, well, it's going to be like an hour and 20 minutes long. This is the whole conference call. You're going to hear just horror story after horror story. This is out outrageous when you hear what they're talking about what you heard on the media i'm sure you know about the tape around their necks and stuff is just the tip of the iceberg so i'm asking you guys you don't have to support me you can take my voice out of the front of this rip it and flip it they don't have a download here on their soundcloud i'll put a link down below to this original if you want to come record your own original or just take this video they're asking to get it to the white house okay can we serve this on a silver platter to Barack Obama? Can we, guys? Or if you're a Barack Obama supporter, you should have no problem getting out to him because the nurses are asking for our help. So who are we going to listen to? The suits or the nurses? The suits are apparently disregarding every safety protocol, according to the nurses. Listen to this video, guys. It's an hour and 20 minutes long. Oh, God, 11,000 nurses, nurses from around the world. So... Our help is being requested. Let's give it. Rip it and flip it. Download it. Re-upload it. Download the audio. Share it. Get the word out. Do it on your own. You don't have to use my video if you don't want to. Much love, guys. Uh, the National Nurses United, and we set this press conference uh, just a week ago or a few days ago. It, it, this, has been, this month has been a nightmare, frankly, for the nurses across the nation. Um, and we said it because the concerns that were coming in were so significant and so consistent that we thought we needed a venue where we actually had the nurses talk to each other so they could hear each other's voices. I think it's, and, and they're looking for answers. And we've been attempting to try to get hospitals in this country to actually hear the nurses, hear the concerns. We've been told a lot of things that have been wrong. We've been lied to in terms of the preparation in the hospitals because, and we know this because the nurses are telling us this and the nurses are the ones who are caring for the patients. This was completely validated yesterday when the nurses from Dallas called us and talked to us and talked to us from the heart and some of the most compelling horrendous stories that Deborah Berger will be reflecting here about what actually happened in Dallas. But what happened in Dallas could happen anywhere and that's precisely the point. So. We've been essentially ignored by the White House and by the CDC, and they've been giving the hospital far too much credit in terms of assuming that they would actually take their advice. And what we've come to is that we have to take pretty dramatic action for nurses across the country. You know, we've threatened the hospitals. We've said that we would do all the things that we need to do. The nurses who are in union hospitals across the country, we have bargaining demands. Those will escalate into you know, possibly pickets with the public to demand safety standards in the hospitals. But for the rest of the nurses in the nation, we've been deeply concerned and we've been grappling with what to do and what can we do and how can we help. And we realized this is outrageous that this is our responsibility. This is the responsibility of our elected officials to actually protect this nation and to protect the first line of defense. So what we've done is to draft a letter to the president and we've sent it. And we're sending it to the governors of the state and to the con congressional caucus. We're sending it to Congress. We're sending it to the president. We're sending it to the governors. And we'll send it to anyone who will listen. And we're asking the president of the United States to invoke his executive authority to protect the nurses and other health care workers in the country. And we'll read the letter. <clears throat> the letter's today, October 15th, 2014. On behalf of registered nurses and other healthcare workers across the United States, we understand that the only way to adequately, adequately confront the Ebola crisis that the World Health Organization has termed the most significant healthcare crisis in modern history 
is for the President to invoke his executive authority to mandate uniform national standards and protocols for all, that all hospitals must follow to provide safety for patients, healthcare workers, and the public. Every healthcare employer must be directed to the following precautionary principle and institute the following. Optimal personal protective equipment, and we go on, full hazmat suits, and we give the specification in line with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, that there shall be two direct care registered nurses caring for each Ebola patient with additional registered nurses assigned as needed based upon the registered nurse's professional judgment. This letter will be available on our website and we'll hand it to the press. That there will be continuous interactive training for nurses who are for nurses, and we go on with more technical language on that. We want the, each employer to adhere to the standards that meet or exceed the University of Nebraska Medical Center or a higher standard if, if it's in use. The Ebola pandemic and the exposure of healthcare workers to the virus represents a clear and, danger, and present danger to public health. What we've heard this morning, obviously, is that more nurses, another nurse has contracted the Ebola virus. We're expecting the situation to be worse. We know that without these mandates to healthcare facilities, we're putting registered nurses, physicians, and other healthcare workers at extreme risk. They are first line of defense. We would not send soldiers to the battlefield without armor and weapons. In conclusion, not one more nurse, not one more patient, our healthcare workers should be put at risk due to the lack of healthcare facility preparedness. The United States should be setting the example on how to contain and eradicate the Ebola virus. Nothing short of your mandate to the president, the optimal safety standards apply, will be acceptable to the nurses of this nation. And we sent that to the United States of America's president today. On this call, we have representatives from across the world. We have nurses who are in the organizations that were exposed to the Ebola virus and contracted the Ebola virus. We have statements from the nurses in Liberia. We have, statement, we have a nurse, registered nurse on the phone from Spain who will be speaking to us. And we have nurses from other countries where the insecurity is, is rampant. Now, I will say this, and, and we've maintained this. The nurses are not fear-mongering. What they're attempting to do is to actually have containment, have the highest standards, to be able to care for patients and care for themselves to basically eradicate fear and to eradicate this disease. But without action at a very high level, the nurses, how can we expect the nurses to do this on their own? The employers, as we heard from the nurses yesterday in Dallas, were told, it's up to you. Well, they don't control the resources of the hospital, do they? I mean, if the nurses controlled the resources, there wouldn't have been an Ebola crisis in this country, no doubt, because we would have had preparedness when the CDC requested that early. So we've got, we're going to hear from nurses across this country. We've, we've told the press continuously that the nurses are saying the same things across the country. We've asked for a cross-section of nurses from across the country and across the world to speak to this. And the way we know this is we very quickly, a month ago, did a, a few weeks ago, or I can't remember, like this is just going so fast, a survey to find out what the nurses were saying. And Zinni Cortez, who is a, a um, vice president of the National Nurses United, is going to read us the results of that survey. And then we'll go to the Liberian healthcare workers' uh, statement. Zinni. As of today, October 15, we have obtained 2,350 responses. Registered nurses from 820 hospitals in 47 states, including the District of Columbia. Our nurses say that 85% of their hospitals have not provided education on Ebola with the ability for the nurses to interact and ask questions. A percentage of that remains largely unchanged. According to the World Health Organization latest numbers, Confirmed or suspected cases of Ebola is 8,914. Confirmed deaths, 4,447. Projections by the week of 
December 2014, the first week of December 14, 2014, there will be 10,000 cases of Ebola in the nation across the world. Official contact count related to the death of Mr. Thomas Duncan, the Texas, the patient in Texas, that's the first patient infected by Ebola in the country. Before he was hospitalized, he had exposed or potentially exposed 48 people. Once he was hospitalized, there were at least 76 more people who were exposed. Thank you. Thank you, Zinni. Uh, Jean Ross, the co-president, is on the line, and she's going to be reading us the statement from the Liberian healthcare workers. Jean, uh, operator, can you unmute for Jean Ross, please? Am I on? Yes. Okay. This is dated October 15, 2014. Statement by Darnold. I'm getting feedback. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Statement by Garlow Williams, General Secretary, Liberian National Private Sector Health Workers Union. Since the outbreak of the Ebola virus in March this year, more than 2,316 of our citizens have died, including 95 health workers, and more health workers are expected to die due to the lack of protective suits whilst fighting the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus has penetrated eight of the 15 counties in Liberia and is impacting many of our neighboring West African countries as well. We experienced some 14 years of civil war and crisis in Liberia that caused a serious brain drain in our health sector. Ebola is now threatening the lives of the few health workers we do have, along with all of our citizens. The long-term impact on our health system will be devastating the situation here in Liberia is dire, and our members, the nurses and other health workers who are on the front lines of this crisis, have bitterly protested the fact that the appropriate, proper protective equipment has not been provided to us. Workers have gone on strike to protest this lack of protective gear and the lack of hazard pay. It is because we have been, not been provided these protective suits that so many of our members have died from the disease. Liberian nurses and other health workers want to take care of our patients, but we don't believe that we should be subjected to a death sentence for doing so. To deal with this crisis, it is imperative that the doctors, nurses, and other health care workers be provided full protective equipment so we don't contract the disease ourselves and are thus able to continue to care for our patients. This is why we are so grateful to National Nurses United in the United States for donating hazmat suits to help fight Ebola in Liberia, and to Global Nurses United for providing support for our union. This kind of international solidarity is exactly what we need, and we would, of course, encourage others to make similar donations. We look forward to working with these partners for the complete eradication of Ebola in Liberia and elsewhere in West Africa. We also want to express our sympathy for the Liberian patient who died in Dallas, and for the registered nurses in that hospital who took care of him and now have contracted the virus themselves. We applaud the stance taken by National Nurses United, calling for hazmat suits for all frontline caregivers, <laughs> and training and drilling for nurses and other caregivers in the United States. We have to remember that the crisis here in Liberia started with a few patients contracting Ebola, and it spread from there. The world needs to address the underfunding of public health infrastructure around the globe to deal with pandemics such as this one. Stand with the nurses in that country and are very, very sad about what's happened to them and what's continuing to happen to them, and it's not acceptable. The National Nurses United did send them a 1,000 hazmat suits because they, they didn't feel safe to take care of their patients. Regrettably, we didn't know that our hospitals wouldn't be providing those to the nurses here at the time as well. Um, and so I, this should happen today. Our hospitals are extremely wealthy. 
We've also from the, the we, we belong to the Global Nurses United uh, organization with other, with, with nurses across the world and we've contributed a generator to help them as well as a laptop computer this week. Um, and so now we're waiting for the, the nurse from Spain to come onto the phone. So in, I was trying to take this in order in terms of how it's happened on different continents, but I will ask um, Deborah Berger to now talk a little bit about what happened, what we found out yesterday in terms of, uh, we had a press conference yesterday, so we've already discussed this with some of you, but just to talk, hit on some of the points about what's happening in Dallas and what we know about Dallas. And we will take questions from the press later on this as well. So I'm Deborah Berger, President of National Nurses United. And what we heard from the nurses yesterday was truly heartbreaking and outrageous and totally preventable. And we want to make sure that this does not ever happen again. I will read some of the instances that indicate how ill-prepared our employers are in this country. First, Mr. Duncan was left for several hours, not in isolation, in an area where other patients are present. Lab specimens from Mr. Duncan were sent through the hospital tube system and uh, instead of being specifically sealed and hand delivered to the lab. The result is that the entire tube system which all lab specimens are sent was potentially contaminated. Initial nurses who interacted with Mr. Duncan wore generic gowns used in contact droplet isolation, three pairs of gloves with no taping around the wrists, surgical masks with the option of an N95 mask and shield, and some supervisors said that even the N95 mask was unnecessary for three days while providing care. The gowns that they were finally given still exposed their necks, the parts closest to their face and mouth. It also left exposed a majority of their heads and their scrubs from the knees down. Initially, they were not even given surgical booties. They were told to use medical tape and had to use four to five pieces of medical tape wrapped around their necks and the tape was not impermeable and it had permeable seams. Nurses had to interact with Mr. Duncan with whatever protective equipment was available at the time when he had copious amounts of projectile vomiting, diarrhea, and other bodily fluids coming from his body. Hospital officials allowed nurses who interacted with Mr. Duncan to then continue normal patient care duties while taking care of other patients even though they had not the proper equipment to uh, personal protection equipment while providing care for Mr. Duncan. Nurses who may have been exposed were one day kept, patients who were one day ex uh, exposed to the Ebola virus were one day kept in strict okay. isolation units. The next day they were ordered to be transferred out of strict isolation into areas where other patients, even those with low-grade fevers, who could potentially be contagious. The nurses said were protocols breached. The nurses say there were no protocols. There was no mandate, mandate for nurses to attend training. There was no advanced hands-on training on the use of personal protective equipment. Even when trainings did occur, Mr. Duncan had, uh, after Mr. Duncan had tested positive for Ebola, they were very limited and did not include having the nurse in training practicing the proper way to don and doff the appropriate personal protective equipment. Guidelines had been changed several times and nurses, in summary, the nurses state that they have been given no policies or regulations regarding cleaning and bleaching of the premises and without access to housekeeping service. There was no one to pick up hazardous waste as it piled to the ceiling. They did not have access to proper supplies, 
and observing the infection control and did observe the infection control department and the CDC themselves violate basic principles of infection control, including cross-contaminating between patients. In the end, the nurses strongly feel unsupported, unprepared, lied to, and deserted to handle the situation on their own. Thank you. I believe that reflects the nurses across the United States, not the world. Um, and not only that we're having some problems in terms of bringing the nurse in from uh, Spain, so we'll ask Martha Kuhl, the NNU treasurer, to read her statement. And this will be the final statement. This is from uh, nurses in Spain. In Spain, we are deeply saddened by the news of a U.S. nurse being infected with Ebola while treating the first U.S. patient that has now passed away from this disease. We are hoping for her quick recovery and for this to be the last case of Ebola that you have to treat. For this reason, we think it is fundamental to open the lines of communication with all organizations of nursing professionals so that we may share experiences, plans of action, and prevent further infections not only in our countries, but also in West Africa, because we all count on nurses working in those regions as, the regions. as the first country to have an infection outside of the current epidemic region, we understand the concern and worry of those citizens and the principal role you play as National Nurses United. The campaign we are currently working on is similar to the one we are working on here in Spain. In our country, it is evident that there is a lack of proper protocol, insufficient training and practice for our nurses and other healthcare workers. The information received by our staff has been insufficient and the training on individual protection gear has not been rigorous enough. In some centers, they didn't even have the materials needed to care for potentially contagious patients. Since the beginning of the crisis in Spain, the Nurses Union has demanded from the authorities on sanitation that all personnel that works in the hospital should have experts with them on this subject, similar to what the Army has in terms of teams of experts that are formed when there is biological risk. The same as organizations that are nonprofit that are dealing and have been dealing with this type of illness for years. Forming personnel to do this work since it's been years now, trying to eradicate this disease in countries as where this new epidemic has started. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open up the lines to some of the nurses across the country to, to talk briefly about what's happening in their hospitals. And I'll start with uh, Lori Hoagland in Oregon. Lori, can you open up the lines for Lori Hogan, please? Yes, this is Lori Hoagland. I'm a nurse practitioner and I've worked for over 30 years in clinics and I'm deeply concerned that if we don't provide the proper tools immediately and the proper protocols that this disease with the rapid movement of people across this country will spread and when people come in with fevers and diarrhea to clinics, there will be no way to tell what whether it's Ebola or the flu. Am I just uh, back? So far, I've gotten Donna. Um, and you know, having worked uh, with RNRN Response Network in uh, Port Limon, Costa Rica, I've experienced mi many, many people waiting in long lines. Um, looking for help, running out of resources very quickly, and so we need to be very proactive and move quickly to contain this virus. It is a deadly enemy that's come to our country and penetrated into our country. Thank you. Texas to Yadira Cabrera. If you could open the line for Yadira Cabrera, please. Yes, this is Yadira Cabrera from uh, El Paso, Texas. And basically what I want to state on this call is that hospitals may say they are ready, but my experience is that they are not. Contrary to what many hospital administrators say about preparedness, nurses at my hospital are reporting a very different story. Uh, what we've seen, for example, is I have, uh, we have received a training of approximately 10 minutes regarding Ebola. Um, and not given uh, an interactive type of training, which is what we demand. 
So we believe that these hospitals must go beyond business as usual um, and prepare accordingly at the optimal and the highest standards. Uh, preparation is not handing out a color printed flyer or sending staff email with links to the CDC website, for example. Um, preparation is not announcing that you will do training in four or six weeks. Preparation is not waiting until the patient arrives in the hospital with Ebola-like symptoms. Um, we, as expert registered nurses, and uh, we have to get educated, trained, and perhaps have some sort of drill with the whole team from the point of triage to treatment all the way to waste disposal. <coughs> Donna Kelly Williams in Massachusetts. Okay, I think we're having a, a problem. I know she's there somewhere. Um, let's go to Sue Cannon in California. We have a room full of nurses from California, by the way, in front of us. So I'm sure all of them have the same story. But uh, Sue Cannon, can you, op operator, can you open the line for Sue Cannon, please? Yes, hello. Hello. Hi, Sue. Hi, I'm Sue Cannon. I've been a nurse since 1997, and in 2005, I went with the RN Response Network to help take care of people who were affected by Hurricane Katrina. Two days after the hurricane hit, um, it was declared, the affected areas were declared a public health emergency, and so many New Orleans residents were without uh, the basics, food, water, uh, medical help for days. Uh, floodwaters that people had to wade through were contaminated not only with sewage, but petroleum and other toxic products. One hospital in the city, you probably remember, Memorial, was stranded with about 2,000 patients and workers who were desperately struggling to survive um, and get rescued. Uh, the needs of these people well, under the microscope that Hurricane Katrina offered uh, showed classic public health issues, sanitation, hygiene, infection control, clean and safe water, access to medical care, all of these things were problems. In America, we watched on our televisions in horror as we saw the failure of our public health system and the failure of our for-profit hospitals, completely unable to handle these needs. Um, if it helped, things did get gradually better. But, you know, Ebola is here. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are protocols already in place. Hospitals just need to give us the protections that we need and uh, keep us safe and keep this contained. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So those who have spoken, if you could um, put your phones on mute because we may come back to you. Okay, I want to go to uh, to New York at this point in time, Anthony Chapa. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Anthony. So tell us what's going Hi. on in New York and your concerns, please. Sure. Um, I'm Anthony Chiampa, a registered nurse at New York Presbyterian Hospital in Manhattan and member of the board of the New York State Nurses Association. So first, the good news. Our public hospitals, in particular the main facility in Manhattan, Bellevue Hospital, has a high level of preparation with protocols in place and round the clock training and drills. Bellevue is the go to hospital for Ebola patients should and when they arrive. Unfortunately, most hospitals are not prepared here. At my hospital, New York Presbyterian, the largest private facility in New York City, preparation, I am sorry to report, is inadequate. Um, we are using generic gowns and gear and not hazmat suits. Here's a short sample of what the nurses are telling me. One, RNs uh, were provided a two-page leaflet on how to put on PPE and had one person demonstrate the proper way to put them on. The in-service was short and a few minutes long. The PPE is not one size fits all, but appropriate sizes are not offered. The PPE impervious blue gowns are similar to the blue gowns on the floor and things can seep into them. The masks and face shields are not sealed and protective as they need to be. 
two. On another unit, nurses report concerns about our Ebola mock code. We weren't actually trained on using PPE, so they were reading the instructions as the nurses put them on. Also, they didn't have all the sizes available. Expectations are not clear when it comes to protocol and Ebola patient care. Frontline nurses are not invited to be part of the decision-making process. The other concern was that they made the simulated patient vomit and bleed out, and the nurse was instructed to clean this up first before housekeeping will go near it, yet that same nurse is expected to touch other patients, put in IVs, etc. We, the New York State Nurses Association, had put in an information request to New York Presbyterian on October 8th based on the University of Nebraska model, and after a week of non-response from them, uh, we learned today that the employer is making improved changes, but we have yet to see acceptable standards of care. So that's my report from New York. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. You're also a member of the UNNU, and we appreciate that. Um, Donna Fleming Kobe from Washington, D.C., please. Could you open the line? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to report that I, I work at Providence Hospital in D.C. Um, we were given some brief in-service with some isolation carts that had the basic um, generic gear to wear. We don't have the, um, the hazmat suits, and I was notified that the unit in which I work on, that's going to be one of the designated unit, units for Ebola patients. And that unit is not equipped to handle Ebola patient care. The room that is designated for this patient is a small room. We use that room for um, TB patients. Um, it's supposed to be a negative flow room. I don't believe it works. The room works because um, normally when the alarm is set and the door is open, the room is supposed to alarm when the door is open, but it does not do that. And um, the nurses are afraid. You know, the, the room that's designated is right up at the front desk, and it's just an accident waiting to happen. Um, a major problem is that we do not have a national integrated health care system. We have multiple corporate hospital chains, each responding to Ebola in their own way or not responding. What is needed is a uniform, coordinated national standard. The focus is Ebola today, but as in the past, inadequate responses to H1N1 have shown we need readiness for all pandemics, as more are surely coming. Um, also, um, during the end service, we were told that we don't have goggles. They said that they couldn't afford the goggles. So it's, it's a mess. We need help. The nurses that are there, and we are the first person. We're triaging the patients. The doctor's not triaging them. The nurses triage the patients. They come into the waiting area in the emergency room. They sign in. They sit down. We have two, we have three closed units in our hospital. Why can't they designate one of those units as an isolation unit? We have no way to decontaminate ourselves. It's a sad, a sad. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, if I were writing the papers, that would be my headline, we need help, um, because that's certainly what we're hearing. Go to John Armelagus in Michigan. Good open the line for John Armelagus. John, are you there? Thank you, Roseanne. Um, what, we, what, we, what we are seeing here in uh, this region of the country is similar. No, I'm, I've been listening in. They say that they're ready, but my uh, experience is that they're not. Um, contrary to what many administrators are saying about preparedness, nurses, uh, in this region are telling us a different story. And in, in part, we've heard that hospitals are allocating cheap materials such as cheap gloves. The nurses have asked for higher quality gloves, for example, that are impermeable. 
nurses have reported they have not gotten instruction uh, when they, if they are going to care for these patients in regards to how to safely dispose of contaminated materials. There are no hazmat suits uh, that we have heard. Um, the nurses are being told that uh, the gowns uh, are what they are to use, and uh, those gowns are in and of themselves not adequate. They're too short. Uh, the shoe and footing coverings are also not impermeable. We've heard uh, from nurses at a hospital uh, where they set up a, a negative pressure room in the ED, but there's no ante room for uh, the other nurse to observe the care that the direct patient care provider, that nurse is providing to the Ebola patient. Further, in regards to this specific example, the room uh, of this negative pressure ED room is left open and it, it's not even ready for use. So that's some of the observations we're hearing uh, in the Midwest. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Donna Kelly Williams in Massachusetts, are you on? I am. Okay. Donna. I'm on with the Thank yes. you. Um, I, I can absolutely say that everything that we've heard is exactly what's happening here as well. But I, I'll just cut to the chase. Um, but most outrageous in Massachusetts is tomorrow they are convening um, a public forum by the Public Health Commission um, for a public hearing on the abortion.
the same. And Can you hear me? Yeah. On you short. Nikki, you want to get control of this? All right. We're going to bring you back in. Sorry, I don't hear you. Hello. <laughs> Should I continue? Spain, please stand by. Um, this is Karen again from Florida. So our nurse, um, when she got home that evening, she called the CDC to try to get some education in regards to Ebola and how to care for her patient and all. Um, she received a call later that evening from her charge nurse and, and then spoke to the nursing supervisor where she was taken off the schedule for the next day. Um, about 20 minutes or so after that, she received a call from her director where she was suspended indefinitely and pending um, investigation. She asked why, and they said that uh, she violated HIPAA because she called the CDC to get education for her and her fellow nurses. Um, and as the union, um, we are fighting for her to get her to be able to be reinstated back to work with back pay, and we still have yet to hear anything from management, and they are kind of avoiding us. That's it. Thank you, Karen. That's disgusting, obviously. The nurses all in this room gasped when you said that. Um, it's, it's difficult because we have four different lines coming in here, one internationally, one with the press, 11,500 nurses, and then other professionals. So I think given that, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, so I'm going to turn now to um, brief presentations with uh, asking Bonnie Castillo, who heads up our registered response network, to conduct the next portion of this, and then we'll go to um, questions. Sure. Thank you, Roseanne. I'm Bonnie Castillo, and I'm the registered nurse response network director. And I just have to say briefly before these other, I introduce the other speakers that um, Generic isolation cards that have droplet uh, precaution, protection, and ill-fitting suits is not protection. It's not preparedness. And in fact, it's setting us up for infection, which is completely unacceptable, and that's why we're here today. So um, from the front lines of West Africa, the first um, uh, presenter, I'm hoping that she's on the line, uh, Rebecca Milner. She's the vice president of the Institutional Advancement International Medical Corps on interna international, she works on international relief efforts in West Africa. Uh, Rebecca, are you on the line? I am. Great. Um, so I just I want to open by um, thanking uh, National Nurses United and the Registered Nurses Response Network for its early support of our efforts to respond to the Ebola outbreak. In fact. Um, NNU and uh, the network were one of the first calls that we received when we announced that we were responding. So I just want to thank you for reaching out to us for that. Um, just a little bit of background about International Medical Corps. We're a first responder to uh, war, natural disaster, famine, and disease. Um, and we've responded to some of the biggest crises of the last 30 years, including you know, the Haiti earthquake or the crisis in Syria right now and the conflict there. Um, and then uh, in um, West Africa against Ebola. Um, the thing that makes International Medical Corps a little different from other humanitarian groups is our focus on uh, training. And we give doctors and nurses the knowledge and skills that they need to take care of their own people over the long term uh, with the goal of restoring self-reliance in these really difficult environments. Um, we've been around for 30 years. We've delivered more than uh, $1.8 billion in healthcare and training to tens of millions of people in 70 countries.
um, at the end of October. And we are exploring opening up two additional ones, both in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And in, a, in addition to providing these, the direct treatment, um, we're also working on training up uh, other health professionals um, on the ground so that they can provide treatment and run Ebola treatment units, um, and which means that we're mobilizing clinicians, logisticians, water sanitation, hygiene professionals um, from around the world uh, and also locally um, to help um, staff up and treat and, and run these facilities. The 70-bed facility in Bong County to run it 24, 7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, requires a staff of 200 people. Um, and that's not only frontline health care workers like nurses, but also um, people that are involved in infection control, as well as um, burial teams. Um, some of the challenges that we see is, is really around training, right? Um, unlike routine primary health care, everything has to be done right with Ebola, surveillance and treatment. If not, I mean, health workers, as everyone well knows, I mean, and you've been talking about this um, for the past hour, um, it, health workers are vulnerable and can be infected. I mean, in Liberia, Ebola is called nurse killer um, because so many in Ni Liberian nurses have died while treating Ebola victims. And um, it's really important that we um, start training people immediately. Um, and it's, it's all of the things that you've been talking about, uh, helping them begin to um, know how to put on the personal protective gear, uh, what to do uh, when treating patients, and then how to um, take off the personal protective gear because that's a very vulnerable time. Um, for health workers, and then what you do with all of the waste. Um, right now, in our ETU, we're burning everything. Incineration is going on 24-7. Need more labs, of course, um, and so that we can quickly determine if patients are positive or negative for Ebola. And then, um, as you all are struggling with in your hospitals, uh, supplies are um, very difficult for us. Uh, the personal protective gear and equipment um, that we need, including generators, fuel, clean water, all of those things um, are really difficult to obtain and um, we're experiencing shortages and that's um, you know, an issue for us on the ground. Do you want to, you know, again, repeat my thanks for your donation of the personal protective equipment um, that you made to the Liberian nurses? I mean, it's really, um, you know, we, we anticipate that for the facilities that we are running that we'll need 25,000 PPEs per month um, to, to run the facilities. Um, these are a few of the immediate challenges, uh, and it, it sounds very, um, Hopeless, but I, but I don't think it is. We do have a window of time to bring, a, to bring this outbreak under control, and as a global community, we can. We simply need to devote the resources uh, and the manpower to stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And um, uh, Rebecca is giving the live report from West Africa, and unfortunately, I think statistically, we're not doing much better here in terms of the number of cases, and we should not be having this incurring the same um, kinds of uh, challenges that they're um, facing in West Africa, we know that we can do better. And my, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Brousseau, who's a professor in the School of Public Health, Division of Environmental and Occupational Health Services at the University of Illinois. Um, Dr. Brousseau, are you there? I am here. Okay, can you hear you. me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the um, invitation to speak to the group. And um, some of you may be familiar with a commentary that I wrote and that was published. I wrote with Dr. Rachel Jones, who is a colleague of mine, and was published on the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy website at the University of Minnesota in the middle of September. Um, I, I wrote, we wrote that commentary because we were asked to consider whether uh, Ebola was an aerosol transmissible disease. And I have to admit, at the time I was asked to consider that, I was somewhat skeptical. But as I looked at the data and read through the literature and began to examine what we do know, what little we do know about Ebola, it became more clear to me that aerosol transmission was a, a, a strong possibility. 
So from what we know about Ebola, it's the m modes of transmission are really not known. What we do know is that there are risk factors based on post-outbreak assessments and epidemiology where you know, living close to someone, living in the same house as someone, working closely with them as a healthcare worker, um, caring for someone, especially in the toward the more severe symptom uh, phase, and um, encountering a, a, an Ebola body uh, during a funeral, uh, all of those are risk factors. Uh, but those fa those risk factors don't really tell you clearly whether it's direct contact with body fluids or it's aerosol transmission or what exactly is the mode of transmission. And as far as I could tell, there are no human studies that will that elucidate that. Um, there is a strong uh, paradigm in the infection control world that direct contact is the only explanation for most disease, inf most infectious disease. And for many years, I've been a proponent of the um, perspective that we should be more careful about ruling out aerosol transmission if we don't have very good data. So what I started to examine with the data in my commentary was what, are, what sorts of information is there about aerosols and aerosol transmission. And one thing that we know about Ebola is that does, it does cause, especially towards the latter phase, more severe symptoms and more severe phase of the disease, that there's a lot of diarrhea. Hello? All of those things are known to cause, uh, to result in aerosols. Um, <clears throat> we also examined the fact that um, there are some data that suggest that Ebola can remain viable in the air. That's another feature that would suggest it's an organism that can be aerosol transmissible. And finally, we examined the data about how the disease is actually pro actually progresses once infection occurs. And it was clear that Ebola is um, able to take advantage of several different kinds of um, uh, uh, cells, including dendritic cells and macrophages. These are cells that are located in all epithelial tissues, including the respiratory system. And um, it's, a very, it's very effective at taking over these cells and um, using them to replicate itself and transmit itself throughout the body. So even though it doesn't necessarily cause what
and sad and very angry about the infection of two healthcare workers so far in Dallas. And I have to say, I don't understand what's happened, except I think that probably the most important reason for this failure in preparation and in proper risk assessment can be pointed direct, can be stated, placed directly at the doorstep of CDC. CDC has failed to consult with the federal agencies that focus on worker health and safety, and by those I mean specifically NIOSH and OSHA. If those agencies and occupational health and safety professionals in general, like me and others like me, had been, had been involved in their preparation, worker safety would have been at the forefront of planning and the precautionary approach would have been a feature of our decision making because the modes of transmission are uncertain and there are few treatments and no cures for this disease. I can't guarantee you we would have said that you need to use a powered air purifying respirator or similar in every situation. I'm not sure that's really the case, but certainly in caring for Ebola patients in the most um, significant features of the disease, one should be using at least a powered air purifying respirator, if not something better, um, and one should be wearing fully impermeable uh, personal protective equipment and have the kind have the training that's necessary to don and doff this equipment. Thank you. You've answered you've answered a lot of the questions that the nurses who've been writing to us have. In fact, that was probably the most significant question of all questions on uh, the form that nurses could fill out. Absolutely. So we um, have one more presenter, uh, Deborah Gold, who's deputy chief of Health and Engineering Services on Healthcare Worker Safety. Uh, Deb, are you on? Yes, I am. Um, yeah, I, I really want to thank you um, for including us in this phone call and, and mostly for the opportunity to listen to everybody here um, and, and, and to hear about your good work on this issue. Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about Cal OSHA's role um, with Ebola right now. We're the agency in California that's within the Department of Industrial Relations that has the mission of protecting the health and safety of employees at work. While isolation precautions for patients may protect the general public, healthcare workers must enter into the environment of infected patients. And therefore, we must ensure that healthcare workers are effectively protected. We are working with the other uh, state agencies under the leadership of the Governor uh, Brown to make sure that healthcare workers do get effective protection. California has two major regulations that apply to Ebola. The first is bloodborne pathogens, which is similar to federal OSHA and requires that employers train employees, utilize universal precautions, which in healthcare are called standard precautions, um, engineering controls, and personal protective equipment to, to protect employees against contact with blood and other potentially infectious materials. Personal protective equipment must be sufficient to prevent the bodily fluids from reaching the employee's clothing or body. And this standard also requires effective disinfection of the worksite and appropriate cleaning or disposal of PPE, which means effective decontamination procedures for, for workers. The second regulation, which is the aerosol transmissible diseases regulation, is a California only standard that was adopted in 2009 with the active participation of the California Nurses Association in the rulemaking process. Ebola is covered by this standard, and according to CDC guidelines, the Ebola virus may be spread by droplets, and the CDC recommends droplet precautions for Ebola. The CDC has also recommended aerosol protections, such as respirators and airborne infection isolation, if aerosol generating procedures are done. The ATD standard made the CDC and CDPH recommendations enforceable by CalOSHA for the protection of employees. This standard requires that employees follow the CDC guidelines for droplet and contact precautions and to follow any additional precautions recommended by the CDPH or the local health departments. CalOSHA regulations also apply to personal protective equipment. Employees exposed to Ebola suspected or confirmed cases should be using fluid resistant PPE which may, if there's not a lot of generation of, air, of fluids, include fluid-resistant gowns or impermeable or fluid-resistant coveralls, head coverings, eye and face protection, such as a face shield, gloves, and any other covering necessary to protect the employee's clothing and skin. In addition, respirators are required to be used in, for any procedure that may generate aerosols. 
the term respirator, as Dr. Rousseau said, refers to a device that's been approved by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health that will effectively reduce the concentration of aerosols that employees will breathe in. The, carousel, the California um, ATD standard is aimed at preventing worker illness from infectious diseases that can be transmitted by aerosols that contain viruses, including Ebola, bacteria, or other disease-causing organisms. While the ATD standard is only mandatory for certain healthcare employers in California, it may provide useful guidance for protecting other workers exposed to Ebola virus. CalOSHA regulations also require that the employer have effective decontamination procedures, which include formal procedures for the doffing, which is the name for removing, and disposing of or cleaning personal protective equipment. Employees must be trained in these procedures and should practice them in dry runs until everybody is comfortable with those procedures. Employees who are also using PPE should assist other employees in donning and particularly in taking off their PPE, and supervisors have to be instructed to oversee the use of PPE. Um, California will work with the Department of Public Health and local health departments hospitals and other employers and employees and their unions to ensure that employees have the necessary protections so that they can do their jobs without fear of exposing themselves and their households. I've only briefly summarized the ATD standard and there's a lot more in there that we hope will be protecting employees in this, um, against this disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And uh, you can be sure that we will be, um, you'll be hearing from us because and I'm glad that you have been on the call because we are quite alarmed with regards to our employers not complying with those standards. We'll be um, asking our governor in California to actually help us with our executive order with the President of the United States as well. Um, okay, now I want to actually change up the agenda a little bit because I know the press has been very patient. This, this conference call was actually for the nurses. Since we have 11,500 nurses on the call, we wanted to provide as many of the answers as they possibly had, as we possibly could. Um, but now I'm going to go to the press questions, and then we'll come back to the nurses again, uh, time permitting. So, uh, do we have the press lines open? All right. So we have a question from the press. Press lines are open at this time. Okay. Identify yourself, please. I know they've been waiting anxiously, and there's a lot of press on this phone. It's a, just it's a difficult. I, I think we've got, like I said, we have four lines coming in. Um, Can I have one question here? Oh, sure. Uh, you want to identify yourself? I'm George Osterkamp. I'm with CBS News. How do you come up with the number 11,500 nurses on the line? We had, um, well, we did this three ways. Uh, we had a Facebook sign up, then we had a website sign up, and then we had another, I don't know what, uh, email sign up. And so on the, um, on the Facebook, we had, well, this is a little while back, so I've got old notes on it. But anyway, the majority of the people of the nurses signed up on Facebook, and then the others on our web and email. So that's how. People had to sign up to be on the call. I have a question. Yes. I'm Rob Arnigo with KGO Radio. KGO Radio. I know it's a sign that uh, don't play nurses and that they're to stop playing nurses, but that's one thing that you didn't mention. Why do you feel that the nurses are being blamed for what's going on? What happened initially in Dallas was on Sunday when the story broke, the nurses, the, the, the first reports out were that the nurse did not follow protocol. What our nurses did were immediately to go in front of Kaiser Permanente, put up a picket, oh, well, that wasn't a picket line. I want to be very clear about that. Um, it was a press conference. A uh, press conference to say that don't blame the nurse. That our folks, we have heard consistently across the country that there are no protocols in place. To blame a nurse, from now, we didn't have to talk to the nurses from Dallas. We knew there were no protocols in place if it was the experience of every other hospital across this country. When we finally made contact with the nurses yesterday in Dallas when they called us, and they called us because the nurses did do that press conference saying don't blame the nurse. They felt like nurses across the United States were supporting them, cared about them, and it touched their hearts. They called us and they were brave enough to speak out 
And we subsequently have our hospitals and the CDC and whoever was saying, well, they, the nurse didn't follow protocol to backtrack from that because what we found was there were no protocols in place for the nurse to follow. Yes. Yes. Okay, well, we have nurses from across the Bay Area, actually, in this room. So how many nurses in the Bay Area feel like your, your hospitals are prepared? Raise your hand. That, that was a question. How many of you feel that your hospitals in your area – oh, let's do it in the adverse. How many feel that – how many feel that their hospitals are not prepared? Okay. So that's kind of just a random sample. Nurses are not – we are in negotiations with a lot of hospitals in the state of California, and I can tell you, and the hospitals can tell you, that they're not prepared. They initially, the, the thing is, what happened initially was they tried to have this facade of preparedness, and it was completely insulting to the nurses. They were telling the nurses who were asking what are the protocols, particularly when the first case was in uh, Kaiser Sacramento, potentially, that didn't occur, that... <laughs> they, the hospitals were acting prepared. They weren't, and we found that out. I mean, Deborah or Zinni can talk about what happened there, but we knew immediately. The nurses were saying the hospitals are telling them when they want to know what to do to, call, to look at the CDC guidelines. It's supposed to be virtual education instead of hands-on, continuous, integrated training. They were saying to the nurses, go look it up on the website. That's outrageous. So there were no – there's inadequate equipment. There's no education and training. There are no protocols in place. In, I can't name a hospital in California. We're in touch with the nurses in California, throughout California, and we find it outrageous. The California hospitals I can speak directly to are in bargaining if the hospitals don't comply. We're asking the President of the United States, and we're serious about this. This shouldn't be on us having to picket individual hospitals across this country or in the state of California or make these demands and fight through the press. This should be the mandate in this country. This should not be onus it should be on the nurses to go and provide the best and highest level of patient care that they can provide in their loving, kind, humanistic manner. They shouldn't have to be policy wonks in terms of figuring out how to get the resources that they need to care for their patients. And that's what they're hearing in California. That's what you just heard in Massachusetts. That's what you're hearing in New York. That's what you're hearing in Florida, Texas, Minnesota, Minneapolis, everywhere, Illinois. I mean, everywhere across this country. And it's being echoed around the world by the nurses who are on this call from around the world. This is an outrageous moment that we're in from a lack, a total lack of public policy and austerity measures that have undermined the care of people across this world. So I think we have a problem with the, the press on the queue. We can't get them. We apologize. I know they'll be calling our communications department nonstop, and they'll, they'll be mad at us. Anyway, the nurses will uh, be available to the press to talk to the press, and the experts will be available to talk to the press. If, there, um, if there's anything that, that anyone here feels unanswered that perhaps we can be responsive to while we have a few minutes, or if there's anyone of the nurses who have spoke who have a further question, we can go to that. But uh, we want to go at this point in time to back to the University of Chicago nurse, and then we're going to be talking about what our toolkit looks like in terms of what we can do. So uh, back to uh, Illinois. Talisa Harden, are you on the phone? Oh. Hello? Yes. Talisa. I'm sorry, when you said an Illinois nurse, I'm sorry, but I'm an industrial hygienist, so I didn't immediately make a connection. <laughs> um, so you have questions? Oh, no, Lisa, no, I'm sorry, wrong. No, I was talking about Talisa. Okay, let's let's skip this part. And let's, wait, let's see. Okay. Uh, well, we, were just, we just found out that New York Presbyterian agreed to the nurses' demand for preparedness during this call. So that's it. Right. They agreed to three nurses to one Ebola patient. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, okay, so um, let's go to what are the next steps. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, so Talisa is on the call. Oh, Talisa? Okay, Talisa? Okay, so, never mind. All right, so... Um, all right, so I just want to uh, remind everyone that we have an Ebola preparedness hotline. We're encouraging nurses across the country and across the world to blow the whistle on their employers. Call us, and we will protect your confidentiality as much as we can at 1-888-381-4585. For unionized nurses, you blow the whistle all the time because you've got those protections. For other nurses, call us. We'll work with you. We are getting a lot of calls, I have to say. What do I do? I don't want to go to work. I don't want to go to work. We're getting a number of those calls. That's not the responsibility of the nurse. The nurse has to provide for her family. That's the responsibility of our government in this country, right? And this is a bipartisan issue. So this is not about the CDC, and I know everyone wants to blame the CDC, and actually, I think a lot of nurses are very mad at the CDC, but this goes much beyond, far, this goes far beyond the CDC. This is our policymakers who have underfunded public health in this country. This is a bipartisan lack of funding. This is a lack of political will. And now those roosters are coming home to roost because we have a crisis in this country and across the world, and no one is impervious to that. Even the rich people who fight against a public health system could be exposed. All right. All right, so now I'm going to go to uh, Michael Leidy here, who's our public policy director, to talk about what our next steps and what to do next. All right, thank you, Roseanne. We have uh, the toolkit that Roseanne referred to is available on our website, nationalnursesunited.org. That includes the letter to President Obama that nurses from around the country will be sending to him. So if you want to get a copy of that letter, pass it on to the President. There it is. Also, the proposed bargaining demands that we are making to hospitals also around the country are in that toolkit. You can use that in your hospital, and that is a guide for the kind of response we expect every hospital uh, to, to make. There's also a nursing practice update on personal protective equipment within the toolkit that you can refer to, as well as whistleblower laws. We certainly don't want to have happen to any other nurse in the country what happened to the nurse in Florida when she tried to get information. So there's also an opportunity to review those laws. We encourage you to send your story of hospital preparedness to Ebola Protection at NationalNursesUnited.org. Ebola Protection at NationalNursesUnited.org. Also, visit the rnrn.org website. You heard from a couple of nurses who participated in our NRN disaster relief program. That's where you can assist efforts in West Africa, is through the rnrn.org website.
optimal protection, period. And we're not going to stop until it's done. You know, if, if we ha it shouldn't be a war to protect our nurses across the world. I mean, it was the scariest thing that I heard on this call is what they, what did they call, Deborah? The killer. killer. The nurse, nurse killer, killer that's what they call them. The yeah. nurse killer disease. The nurse killer disease. My God. My God, I think that's into chill to everybody that's on this call. So, you know, we are not going away. The National Nurses United is not going away. We're not going to be delegitimized. We're not going to be silenced. And we're going to fight all the way down the line for every nurse in this country and across the world to have the optimal standards to take care of their patients. Nothing short of that is acceptable. And I'm telling you, I know our leadership, and they're not going to back down. So, you're, you know, we're with you. I know people are very fearful at this point in time, but the best way to confront that fear is through preparation, and we all know that, to be ready, to re be ready to take care of your patients. So we got one last point here from Michael. Yeah, Eddie. I have to correct the email address, sorry. Ebola prevention at nationalnursesunited.org. Ebola prevention at nationalnursesunited.org. We want to hear your stories about the inadequacy of hospital preparation. The way to stop Ebola is to be prepared. It's, to, it's for containment, and the ones who are on the front line are the ones to do that. You shouldn't be in this position. We apologize for the fact that you're in this position, but you have the you you know you might not have all the policymakers in this country with you, but I can tell you this: you've got the people of the world with you. The public trusts the nurses. Number one, in credibility, the public trusts you. The public's with you. And so when people say, well, you've got all these groups that are agreeing with, you know, the CDC or the lack of standards, who's on your side? And we say, oh, that one small group is called the public. Thank you. And now here's a short sample of Nurse Talk, brought to you by National Nurses United. Okay, guys, you heard it. They're asking for our help to get the letter to Obama to him. So far they've ignored it. I doubt they'll ignore it much longer. You heard the crowd clap in there. One of the hospitals agreed to the demands while the call was going because they know. Public opinion on this is hands down. Whether you think Ebola is real or not, a hoax or 100% or an epidemic, you can all agree that if an epidemic's occurring, that the proper protocols should be taken and the proper safety measures should be taken. Just in case. Okay? So get the word out. The links are down below. I'll put the link to Obama's letter directly below so you can send that right on over to him, okay? <laughs> oh, seriously, rip it and flip it, guys. Much